Adam Witte, it's such a pleasure to welcome you to the Business of Innovation podcast. Thank you. Ever since I've been at Clemson, I've been hearing your name. So I've been so excited to sit uh, with you and to be able to ask you questions and learn more about your life's work, which is absolutely fascinating. You are um, the CEO of Advantage Forbes Books. You are also an entrepreneur, of course, and a writer and, uh, and a Clemson graduate, we're proud to say. So tell me about what you're currently doing and how this came about. Yeah, so, you know, like all great things, they start at Clemson. Uh, <laughs> and so that's really where I got my entrepreneurial start. In fact, the first business that I ever started was in my dorm room at Clemson awesome. in uh, the year 2000. Tell. So uh, I started a company in my dorm room. It was called TicketAdvantage.com. Uh-huh. And it was a marketplace to buy and sell sports tickets for fans. So if you were a season ticket holder and had games throughout the season that you couldn't go to, then you would put them up on TicketAdvantage.com and it would give fans the opportunity to buy really good tickets. Mm -hmm. And ultimately that was a business that that didn't succeed long term. And, you know, one of the things that everybody should know if they're going to get into the game of entrepreneurship is not every venture is a success. Mm -hmm. In fact, you've got to learn from the failures and then capitalize on that and make the next one that much better from what you learned. Uh, But starting that first business at Clemson was one of the greatest experiences of my life. And I had a mentor who said to me, you know, Adam, you've got nothing to lose, right? You're not married. You have no children. You you don't have a mortgage. So Mm -hmm. if you've got an idea, why not go for it? Sure. And Clemson provided a supportive atmosphere from the faculty to the dean to the president of the university. Like they were just so excited to help a student who was starting a business while in school. Mm-hmm. And I guess that's more commonplace today, but but in 1999 and 2000, it, it was much more rare. Mm-hmm. And so that was where I got my start. And although that business did not ultimately succeed, uh, I have gone on to create a, a few more businesses that fortunately have. Uh, so the company that I run today, Advantage Forbes Books, mm-hmm. is one of the largest independent business book publishers in the country. Uh, I started that company in 2005 in Charleston. And that business has spawned a few other businesses, some of which you may not even know about. Uh, And so today, the Advantage family uh, comprises four different businesses. Of course, our our publishing business Mm -hmm. uh, being the core of that. Publishing, and tell me about the others, too. Yeah, so uh, Advantage Forbes Books is our publishing business. We Mm -hmm. have a marketing, education, and training company. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's called Magnetic Marketing. Okay. We have uh, two software companies. So one is called BPR 360. BPR is Business Plan Review. Mm -hmm. It's a business performance management software tool. Nice. And we actually founded that business with one of our authors, and uh, the fourth business is called M Live, which stands for Marketing Live. Mm-hmm. It's a multi-step direct response marketing automation software system uh, for dentists of all things. That's our that's our niche for that product. But publishing, that's so interesting that you went into publishing. I mean, a lot of people want to be published, but right. rarely do they become publishers. How did that happen? Yeah, no, nobody dreams of becoming a publisher. Let me set the record straight right now. Uh, so when I was in high school, I had uh, the fortune to spend two summers as an intern at a publishing company. I didn't think it was a fortune at the time mm-hmm. because my parents said, Adam, you've got to get a summer job which I wasn't so excited about. Mm -hmm. But I call it a fortune because ultimately it created the foundation that is now, of course, a part of my career. So I go to work for this publishing company in Central Florida, where I grew up as a kid, Mm -hmm. and I spent two summers learning everything about making books. The writing, the editing, the design, the printing and packaging, the distribution and sale of books, like everything, a Mm -hmm. a complete 360 degree view of the book business. And what I thought I would hate, I ended up finding pretty interesting Mm -hmm. and fascinating. And I went off to Clemson for my freshman year and I didn't think twice about it. I didn't think the publishing business would ever come into my life again. Mm -hmm. So I started the ticket business at ClemsonTicketAdvantage.com. Ultimately, that business wasn't a success. I wasn't really able to scale it and grow it. Uh, So I'm back at home in Central Florida, and I'm having lunch with a mentor of mine. And this mentor was a pretty well-known business person in Orlando, and he had written a number of books. 
And the books really made him, for lack of a better word, a, a celebrity. Uh, he was on TV a lot. He was asked to speak all over the world. And the books were really the calling card that opened mm-hmm. up all of those doors. And I remember we're having lunch and he said, Adam, you need to start a publishing company for entrepreneurs and business owners. Because when they write the book on the topic, Mm -hmm. they are seen as the authority and the expert on that topic. Mm -hmm. And it helps grow their business. It helps make them a magnet for opportunity. It it really puts them in a category of one, for for lack of a better word. Well, at the time, I didn't have a better option. Like, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I had just graduated Mm -hmm. and I didn't have a job and I, I had nothing. So I said, okay. Sounds like as good of an idea as any that I can think of. And I said, let's do it. So on July 19th of 2005, not long after I'd graduated, I opened up the doors for Advantage Media Group. You're 22. I'm 22 at the time. Wow. Right? Didn't know squat. Yeah. (laughs) Right? I mean, certainly I had a college degree, but like, Mm -hmm. you know, starting a business and growing a business, I mean, that, that's real world stuff that, mm-hmm. you know, you can't learn in a class. You have to learn through real world experience. And uh, so I started picking up the phone and I started calling people. You know, I knew people in the business world and I said, hey, what if we could help you write and publish a book? Imagine. People want that. And, and certainly we were very they fortunate do. because it's something that people wanted. So we were having conversations where we were talking about things that people were interested in, yes. right? It's not like we were trying to sell life insurance or a burial plot. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we, we had a conversation that people were engaged in and mm-hmm. were interested in. So that helped a lot. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, I, I had to learn to be a great salesman. Mm-hmm. I had to learn to be a great marketer. And fortunately, those four years of education at Clemson, I was a marketing major, yes. uh, helped pay off. And so I was able to start the business and, and scale it. And uh, today it's a, a company based in Charleston with close to 100 people uh, on our team, That's a number of, number of Clemson graduates. Yes. Uh, I, I always say we are an equal opportunity employer, so we do hire <laughs> Gamecocks. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's turned into this fabulous business. Uh, We're known all over the world, and certainly in 2016, Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps the biggest feather in our cap is Steve Forbes and the team at Forbes Media Mm -hmm. uh, were looking for a partner that they could create a book business with, Mm -hmm. and they ultimately chose us. Amazing. How did that happen? Uh, So Forbes is 102 years old, and in that long history, uh, they have grown to become the largest business magazine in the world, Mm -hmm. but they had never published books. And when we were connected with them, we said, well, well, gee, you've got a platform of 94 million monthly readers. Mm -hmm. People come to you because they know know you and they trust you for business information Mm -hmm. and business content and business news. What if we took uh, some of your best uh, content? What if we took some of your best uh, contributors and writers and then went out and find, found other contributors and writers and turned them into authors published under the Forbes label. Mm-hmm. And so the idea, of course, was one plus one would equal mm-hmm. hopefully five, mm-hmm. maybe more than five. Mm-hmm. And, and that was how it all began. So that was now uh, three and a half years ago. And uh, since then, it's been a great partnership. And, and Forbes Books has become one of the best known uh, luxury, if you will, uh, high-end prestige business book brands mm-hmm. uh, around the world today. And it sounds like you actually pitched that idea. You it was. Did it, you seek it out and it, uh, the Forbes group out and pitch? Is that kind of what I'm hearing? So it was salesmanship uh, 101, right? Yes. Uh, so they, they had an interest and they were looking, mm-hmm. but I really had to close the deal because mm-hmm. there were other partners sure. that they were looking to work with that were, that were far bigger companies mm-hmm. than us. I think what really um, sold the deal, if you will, mm-hmm. is that our belief is that a book is the most powerful marketing tool in the world. Mm-hmm. And entrepreneurs and CEOs that work with us to create a book, they're doing it not because they're going to necessarily become a New York Times bestseller. Mm-hmm. Everybody that writes a book dreams of that, but very few actually accomplish that. But when you write the book in the right way and publish it in the right way, Mm -hmm. you can truly use it to grow your authority Mm -hmm. and to grow your business. And our business model has always been about, it doesn't matter how many copies you sell. Mm -hmm. It's how do you most effectively leverage a book to grow your business? 
because one new customer, one new strategic partnership, one new opportunity mm -hmm. could be worth more than the combined income of selling right. tens of thousands of books, right. right? And so because of that, and because our business model was unique and different, and it wasn't based on selling books in bookstores, mm -hmm. which which is a very hard business. Sure. Uh, that really intrigued and captivated the minds of the executive team at Forbes. Um, I have so many questions at this point, but I am going to go back for just a moment yep. to that young person who had this mentor, heard the mentor in there encouraging you to do this. You've seen the inside of a publishing company, and all of a sudden you're hanging a shingle or sign, and you're starting a business. How did you? What was that learning curve? What did that look like? And how did you? How did you do it? Yeah. So um, somebody once said to me that entrepreneurs are not necessarily people that embrace and seek risk. Mm -hmm. I think that there's this idea that, oh, entrepreneurs are daredevils and they love risk. Well, no, I don't think there's any person that knowingly says, you know what, I'm going to take all of my money and I'm going to take all of my energy and I'm going to just, you know, hope and pray, mm -hmm. right? Nobody wants that. But one thing about entrepreneurs is that I think they're much more comfortable with uncertainty than, than other people. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's not as though I was a risk taker and that's right. what led me to go out and start a business. But I've always had this attitude of, it'll be okay. Yeah. We'll figure it out. Can it, figure it out. Can... It, it, it'll, we'll make it work, yeah. right? Don't, don't worry. We'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been very comfortable with not knowing for mm -hmm. certain what the future will bring. Mm -hmm. So I'm comfortable with uncertainty. And I guess I've always had a, a strong enough belief in myself mm -hmm. that, that I and the people around me, we could work together and figure it out. And, and there's no doubt. I mean, to start a business and scale a business, you've got to have a pretty high level of self-confidence. Mm -hmm. Now, some people, it goes well beyond that into right. narcissism, yeah. but you've got to ha have a healthy dose of believing in yourself. And the one thing that I believe more than anything else is that if I'm going to bet on somebody, I'd rather bet on myself than anybody else mm -hmm. because I believe in myself and I know that when I apply myself, I know what I'm capable of, mm -hmm. right? Just like each individual person probably knows what they're capable of too. And so my argument is if you're graduating from college and everybody says, oh, you know, take the safe route, go get a job with a big company. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think that's risky because you have no idea what middle management or upper management might do. They may decide to keep you, to lay you off, to fire you at a whim or a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. But when you control your own destiny, when you bet on yourself, I actually think that's the safest thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. And so... For me and my journey, I've never seen it as a risky proposition at all. Mm -hmm. If anything, I've seen it as the safest pathway available to me. Bet on myself. Mm -hmm. So you were able to just roll up your sleeves and figure it out in terms of how to get that book written and co collect the, the content from the conversations and, and so forth. You had your mentor. You went out and sold the idea. Yep. Yeah, so, so I always say that, you know, until the cash register rings, you don't have a business, mm -hmm. right? You can design a nice business card, you can have letterhead, you can have a website, mm -hmm. but until somebody gives you money, there's nothing to do, right? right? You got to get a customer. And so once you have a customer or customers, then you have a real business. And so mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I tell young people all the time that are interested in entrepreneurship is the number one skill you must get comfortable with and truly embrace is salesmanship. Mm -hmm. Because there is no one that will sell and market and project your company into the marketplace better than you. No. Even if you don't see yourself as a salesperson. No. There is nobody that can sell a business better than the founder. Mm -hmm. And so entrepreneurs that really embrace and excel at selling and, and salesmanship, I'll call it, mm -hmm. those are the ones that I believe have the most success. You know, nine out of ten businesses started don't ever make it past five years. And for those that do make it, only a small fraction even make it to more than a million dollars mm -hmm. in annual sales. So this salesmanship thing is, you know, it's pretty darn important. Very important. Yeah. So what do you love most about what you're doing now? <sighs> Man, that's a, that's a big question. And uh, I've got a big answer. I, I think that uh, there's so much that I love about what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, Mark Twain said the object of life is to make your vocation your vacation. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I've done that. Uh, I look forward to Monday. Yeah. 
you know, and when you look forward to Monday, when you truly love what you do, Mm -hmm. you're one of the luckiest people in the world. You know, when you're engaged, when you're fulfilled from your work. And if you think about it and do the math, you will spend more time professionally working Mm -hmm. than in any other facet of your life. Spend more time at work than with your kids, with your spouse, Mm -hmm. at church, at school activities, whatever you want to make up, Mm -hmm. certainly more than sleeping. And so why not love what you do? I mean, it really is a choice. So for me, I feel like I'm so lucky because I have the opportunity to do what I love each and every day. Mm -hmm. I would also say that as our business has grown, you know, from, from me in a spare bedroom in my apartment to now a, a, a much larger organization with, with close to 100 full-time team members, uh, as the business has grown and as we've achieved some level of scale, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of it is now growing people. Developing your people. Developing your people. Yes. Because as a company grows, you as the founder, you as the CEO, no matter how good you are, no matter how strong you mm-hmm. are, you can't pull the wagon all on your own. No. You're just not strong enough. So you've got to have other people on your team that are pulling that wagon with the same might and force as you. And you've got to grow people into that role. A, a mentor of mine, he said, Adam, your job is not to grow a company. Your job is to grow people mm-hmm. that grow a company. So if I look at my schedule, like on any given week, I spend more time working with, interacting with, mm-hmm. talking to people than anything else. And as a company grows, the leader is most likely going to spend more time thinking about the business and interacting with people on the business rather than doing things in the business, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to let go of all the things you do if you want to grow. Mm -hmm. You've got to build a team of people that can do the things that you once did. And as the leader, you really have to focus on growing people, creating managers that can lead other people. That that's ultimately, I think, how you create scale. So how are you growing your people and creating that kind of learning, growing um, culture in your business with 100 employees? Yeah, yeah. so so it's not easy, right? Uh, I mean, I I say all the time, if it was easy, everyone would do it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Growing a business is not easy uh, because there's so many things that have to go right. You know, if you look at some of the most successful companies in world history, there's also this huge dose of luck that Mm -hmm. plays into it as well, right? I mean, if Steve Jobs had come along 50 years before, would he be the named person that we all know today? Well, probably not because technology and innovation wasn't at a point at that place to capitalize on his unique talents. So, you know, growing and scaling a business, there's, there's a part of it that's hard work. Uh, and then there's a, there's a part of it that's luck, too. I, I don't mm-hmm. want to dismiss that. Uh, so how do you grow people, right? Well, number one, you... You, 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 you genuinely care about them, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and, and you got to spend time with them, right? Just like kids, don't tell me that I love my kids with all my heart, mm-hmm. and then I look at your calendar and you spend no time with them at all mm-hmm. during the week. Mm-hmm. You know, your calendar tells me what your priorities are. Yes, it does. Right? And your checkbook. And your checkbook. Your calendar and your checkbook tell you what your priorities are. And so to that point, how much time are you spending on growing your people? Mm -hmm. And how much are you financially investing in growing your people through education, through training, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So I try to spend uh, a lot of time, especially with my my key people, right? I I have a structured, scheduled one-on-one with every senior leader on our team uh, every two weeks. Mm -hmm. So every month I got to have two one-on-ones where I'm doing a a check-in. Uh, and we're t- of course, we're talking about business things, but I'm also checking, like, how are you personally? What's mm-hmm. your professional high? What's your professional low? I love that. What are you most excited about um, mm-hmm. personally? Mm-hmm. You know, what's not going so well personally? Yeah. Anything I can help you with, right? Because That's perfect. Because what you do day in and day out from nine to five carries itself home. And what happens at home from, from you know, 5 p.m. until 9 the next morning, guess what? It carries itself back into your professional work as well. And so creating that, that work life, a lot of people call, a lot of people talk about work-life balance. Mm-hmm. And I always say as an entrepreneur, you got to throw that out the window because mm-hmm. if you want to start a business and scale a business, forget about work-life balance. 
what matters to me more is work-life purpose. Mm -hmm. Because when you love what you do, you don't look at the clock. Yeah. You don't care. And if you can create a team of people that truly are engaged and fulfilled in what they do, mm -hmm. then they're not going to pay as much attention to the clock either. How did you know to be this kind of leader and this kind of manager? Because you jumped into this almost as your first right. venture. <clears throat> so but yeah. you're describing some very effective ways of making people feel cared about and engaged and personally and professionally, what excites you. People want to be seen and heard. They Absolutely. love that you're asking these questions. So how did you know to do that? Well, so I didn't know. And if you speak to some people that probably worked with me early in my career, they, they may not say favorable things about me as a manager and a leader. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think good leaders are born. I think good leaders are, are made. And good leadership is made by applying yourself, learning from mentors mm -hmm. and peers, and having the humility to look at yourself in the mirror and fully assess what you're good at and what you're not so good at. Mm -hmm. And either A, work to improve those weaknesses or completely delegate it to somebody else mm -hmm. so you're not doing those things, right? So for me, it was mentors, yes, right? Uh, and coaches, mentors and coaches, sure. uh, peer groups, yes, and a lot of self-study. Yeah. I, I think that, that the greatest leaders are the ones that spend a lot of time working on themselves. Yeah. And, and constantly applying themselves to learn more. So, you know, I read 35 to 40 business books a year, um, which may not seem like a lot on the surface, but, but the average American mm -hmm. male after high school graduation will not complete another book in their life. No. Is Serious? that a true statistic? That is a true statistic. So um, readers are leaders, right? Mm -hmm. You know, applying yourself, reading, consuming great mm -hmm. content to nourish your mind. So I spent a lot of time working on myself. And, you know, as good as a leader mm -hmm. as maybe sometimes I want to think I am, mm -hmm. the truth is I still have a long way to go. So you love learning. Mm -hmm. You've definitely had mentors. You're a good listener. And you really take to heart what people are, are, are telling you and advising you as evidence of, from the very first um, endeavor you've had in your career. Yeah. They, they say that uh, God gave you uh, two ears and one mouth, and you should use them proportionally. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so, yeah, I think good leaders are good listeners. Mm -hmm. And what makes it hard, especially when you're growing a business and, and you're kind of inventing it as you go. Yes. Like, I mean, in many ways, we are building the airplane as we're flying it. Sure. People are going to tell you stuff that you don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. And and this was hard for me. I think it's hard for everybody, right? And so every leader, every manager wants to hear the good stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. And when we start hearing the truth, which is sometimes the bad things, the things that aren't working so well, mm -hmm. you know, that, that smile turns into a frown. And if we don't watch ourselves, then we we teach people not to tell us the bad stuff. Very true. And now we only have 50% of the story. Mm -hmm. It's hard to make really good decisions when you only have half of the information available to you because mm -hmm. the other half, that's the stuff that's not working or the bad stuff, well, people are afraid to tell you because perhaps of the way you'll react or mm -hmm. you know, he doesn't really want to know the truth. He just wants to hear what he thinks mm -hmm. you know, he wants to hear. You, you've heard the term yes men and yes women. Mm -hmm. That's cancer in an organization because all of the challenges, and there's plenty in every company, and you get swept under the rug. Yes. Well, if you don't know what's going on, then you can't do anything about it. How do you encourage learning in your organization in terms of reading? Are there, are there people that gather for mm -hmm. article reviews <clears throat> or book reviews? I mean, you're in the publishing business. I'm just curious if that's part of it. So we demand it. And that might seem like a strong word to some people, mm -hmm. but... Um, Cultures are created by design, mm -hmm. not by default. Now, what I should say is great cultures are created by design, sure. not by default. Poor cultures are typically just the default of mm -hmm. whatever it is it is. And so I intentionally made the decision that I wanted my organization to be a learning culture, mm -hmm. right? I wanted to have people that were learning and growing because, because if a company is growing like this, 
and the people in the company are only growing like this, mm -hmm. then the company is going to outgrow the people, mm -hmm. which means you're going to have to replace those people. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's very expensive to do. However, if you really focus on being a learning organization and you create guardrails in your business to really demand and enforce that people are professionally developing themselves, mm -hmm. then the people in that company can grow at the same or greater rate mm -hmm. as the company, which then means that you can keep people engaged and working in the organization for a very, very long period of time, which is good for the business, and it's also it's good for the culture, and it, it's also good for them, right? Yes, it is. Because if a, if a person comes to a company and they grow and they have the opportunity to grow with the company, mm -hmm. both sides are, are made better off. So that's what we try to do is we require 120 hours of professional development mm -hmm. each year from every Advantage team member. Okay. Uh, we provide every team member with a $1,000 continuing education credit mm -hmm. so they can use that money for books, for courses, for mm -hmm. seminars. Uh, it ju there just has to be a direct path of how learning this skill or improving this skill directly has a positive impact for them and the, the company. They share that back. That's right. They share that back. Okay. And, um, and we, as a core value, one of our five core values as mm -hmm. a company is commit to lifelong learning. Okay. And it works for the business we're in. Our, our core business scale is writing and publishing exactly. business books. Yeah. So some of it's just practicing what we preach. And I know that a lot of organizations want employees to take ownership, but they don't always do the kind of thing that you're talking about. So you're putting the money, you know, there where uh, your mouth is, and you're saying, um, you know, use this in a way that best serves you because so much of learning is vertical learning. Of course. So. Yeah, you know, one of the things I say all the time is that if somebody on your team comes to you and says, hey, you know, I'm, I'm due for a raise, mm -hmm. then I would always ask the question, great. Show me how you've invested in yourself for the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. Show me your learning plan. Mm -hmm. And if they have nothing to show, yeah. it's pretty simple. Well, you didn't invest in yourself. Mm -hmm. Why are you asking me to invest more in you? Right, right. So you're putting it back on them. Yes, you own this. Right? Mm -hmm. you, you've got to take ownership for this. Yeah. Whereas if you come to me and say, let me show you all the ways that I have invested in myself, I read these books, I took these classes, mm -hmm. I went to these seminars, mm -hmm. I attended this and this and this and this and this. Right. Well, now you can show me somebody that's serious about themselves. They're a student, they mm -hmm. apply themselves, mm -hmm. they want to be better. Mm -hmm. Well, heavens to goodness, those are the people I would want mm -hmm. to be working with. Those are the people I would want in my company. Do you find that people are drawn to your culture because of what you do, the publishing, the books, the content that's everywhere? Mm -hmm. I, I would think you draw a certain... Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, every company is going to draw a certain person based on mm -hmm. the what they do, sure. right? So, you know, if you're, if you're uh, a golfer or you play tennis, then you might be drawn to work for a company that's in mm -hmm. that industry. Oh, well, that's a passion of mine. So, so, so I guess that's obvious. Mm -hmm. However... I think on top of that, um, you know, what draws people to us is, is they're lifelong learners. Mm -hmm. uh, they believe in the family environment that we're trying to create, mm -hmm. right? I'll use an example that's close to home. Okay. So if you look at the culture that Dabo Sweeney has created with the Clemson football program, and you compare that to the culture that Nick Saban has mm -hmm. built at the University of Alabama. Both are championship cultures. Yes. Both are winning cultures. Neither one is right or wrong, but they're extremely different. Different. The player that wants to come to Clemson is not necessarily the player that wants to go to Alabama mm -hmm. because they're, they're very different. And so for us, we look at ourselves in the exact same way that Coach Sweeney looks at the football program, mm -hmm. is that we want to create a culture that is inviting and attractive to the person mm -hmm. that we think fits the advantage mold, mm -hmm. the person that really adds tremendous value to our culture, and our culture can add value back to them. And for the people that don't like what we do, mm -hmm. we hope we repel them, yes. right? We hope they're not attracted to us yes. at all. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, if you have a great culture, uh, you're going to attract your person. Look, the, the thing that you know and I know and I think probably everybody watching this knows is that great people, like really talented people, mm -hmm. they want to work with great 
companies mm-hmm. and they want to work with great people at great companies. Mm-hmm. You know, A players don't say, gee, sign me up to go work with a C organization. Right. No. A people want to work with A companies. Mm-hmm. And so in that regard, the culture of a business is the number one factor in who you attract mm-hmm. to want to come into that business to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. So as I'm listening to you and I'm hearing about your culture and your philosophy and what you're growing, the culture, how you're approaching it, what's your biggest challenge right now? Well, there's a lot of really big challenges, Gail. I'm, I'm getting married in eight days. That's right, you are. So, that, so there's a lot <laughs> just going on there. I'm pretty, pretty busy. That's pretty exciting. Um, you know, so one of the great challenges for me is as the company grows, I continue to ask myself, am I the right person, mm-hmm. right? I think that, that any leader has the humility to always look in the mirror and say, Am I the right person for this job at the right time? Mm -hmm. And and for now, the answer continues to be yes. I think I am the right person. Uh, I think I can do the job that needs to be done to get us to the next level. Mm -hmm. Certainly as the founder, there is the story, there's the passion, there's the energy that would be very hard to be replicated with somebody else. Mm -hmm. But as the company gets bigger, there's also the myriad complexities of bigger companies that I don't have previous experience with. Mm -hmm. And as a more entrepreneurial person, some of those myriad complexities Mm -hmm. are also not very fun to me, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that the greatest challenge that I face is is continually reevaluating myself Mm -hmm. to know, am I the right person for the job? Mm -hmm. And and if, if I get to the point where the answer is no, where do I fit in in the organization to add the most value? And constantly, you know, on an annual basis, asking yourself that. And then to take it to another level, you know, asking people that will tell you the truth. Right. Uh, won't sugarcoat it. They will tell you the truth. Asking other people the same thing. Am I the right person for the job? Uh, and if I am, mm-hmm. what skills do I need to develop? over the next year in order to elevate myself Mm -hmm. to continue to to do the job well. So I think self-reflection, right? So which is a question for anyone in any role, really, to to be asking people around them. What do you like most about yourself as a leader and what do you struggle with? What's the biggest challenge or maybe something you don't like as much about yourself? Uh, What I like most about being a leader uh, is that I genuinely like people. And I genuinely care about people. Mm-hmm. And, and I genuinely want to see people grow mm-hmm. and succeed. Mm-hmm. And I think that in order to be, um, I won't say to be an entrepreneur, but in order to be a, a leader, and being an entrepreneur and being a leader aren't always the same thing. Sure. But, but in order to be a leader, I think you truly have to have a heart for people, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you, you look at Coach Sweeney. I mean, he has a heart for his players mm-hmm. um, that, that is so big. And it emanates out of him, right? You can see it in every press conference. You can see it on the sidelines. You can see it in interviews. And so he he loves what he does because he loves the lives he has the ability to shape. Mm -hmm. And if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a CEO, if you're a founder of a business, I mean, Mm -hmm. you have the same unique opportunity as Dabo Sweeney, which is you get to shape lives, uh, in a significant way. Mm-hmm. And if that's something that you love, that you see as an honor, then then keep pursuing that path. Mm-hmm. If you see it as a nuisance, if you see it as, uh, I really don't like people, I don't want to deal with this. Yeah. Well, that's okay, but find somebody that can come in to the organization that is really good at that, yes. that can do it, right? And you look at the difference mm-hmm. between Dabo and some of the coaches at Clemson before him, mm-hmm. and you can see a pretty big difference. That's true. I mean, it's not like there's a big surprise as to why we've had this success mm-hmm. over the last mm-hmm. decade that no. we've had. You know, who the leader is mm-hmm. matters. Mm-hmm. It matters a lot. And um, I would add the same is true of our president. Absolutely, the right? The same you, almost kind of emanating out of how you, much he cares. You can see the passion and the energy from Jim Clements. I think his question every day is, who can I serve today? Absolutely, yeah. right? And And when you see yourself as a servant-based leader Mm -hmm. versus a what can people do for me to help me get my job done, Mm -hmm. then your whole outlook changes. So I think what I like most is is the ability to work with people. I mean, 
you know, I couldn't work from home. I, I couldn't work on an island by myself mm-hmm. because I get energy from mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. There are people in the world where being around others drains their energy. It's true. And there's others where being around people really elevates and, and, and drives up their energy. So you've got to know which of the two you which of those two buckets you, you fall into. Um, <clears throat> you know, what do I what do I like the least about what I do? Or about yourself as a leader? Uh, well, I, as as what do I like least about myself as a leader is, you know, it it, it can be it's very difficult to hold yourself accountable all the time. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, you know, when, when somebody gives you bad news, <clears throat> say in a, in a professional context, in the mm-hmm. office, somebody gives you bad news, something that you don't want to hear. I mean, it's hard not to not want to snap, not to be angry, not to be upset, mm-hmm. right? It's hard not to want to point the finger and blame or, well, well that was your, this is your fault. Like, you got to fix this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just so naturally instinctive. And I've made the mistake where I have violated, you know, holding myself accountable where I've I've not lost it and snapped and thrown something across the room. But it would be very easy for me to say, well, you know, I think this is on you, Mm -hmm. right? Versus, you know, looking inward first and saying, okay, what can I do to support you? Right. What can I do to help you fix this? Right. So it's constantly holding yourself in check. That's... That's hard, and you know certainly, mm-hmm. I'm I'm not proud of every single thing I've ever done as a leader and as an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And my goal is each and every day, each each month, each year, is to make the percentage of things you do right that much greater than the percentage mm-hmm. of the things you do wrong. Yeah. What do you feel? And this may be a hard question for you, but what do you feel like you're most proud of in your career? Boy, you know, I I guess I I don't spend a lot of time thinking about that, right? Uh, only because I feel like every single day, you know, we've got to be a better version of ourselves to mm-hmm. compete and win in the marketplace. Um, competition is fierce. Mm-hmm. Business is hard. We live in a global economy and a global environment where, you know, a, a startup in Tokyo could take you out tomorrow if you don't have your eye on the ball. I mean, that's literally the world that we live in. So, so spending a lot of time emanating on success or accomplishments, Mm -hmm. I don't think gets you very far. And and I don't think it's a healthy thing to do. And maybe you rather use the word grateful, you know. So I love that word. I love the word grateful. Um, So what am I most grateful for? You know, I I really believe on a personal level, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I feel like I was born in the greatest country in the world. Mm -hmm. If you're an entrepreneur Mm -hmm. and you want to start a business, Mm -hmm. there is no better country to do that than the United States. Yeah. Uh, I think about the opportunity to go to college, which not everybody has the opportunity yeah. to do. I think about coming to Clemson and being in this environment that was supportive and encouraging of starting a business. Mm-hmm. You know, I think about the great fortune to have landed in Charleston, yes. which is one of the most magnificent oh, cities yes. in the world. And so I just look at all of these steps and I'm like, man, I, yeah. I hit the lottery. Yes. I, I, I really did. So I'm grateful for that uh, on, on a professional level. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'm really just grateful for the opportunity to grow a company, the opportunity to mm-hmm. serve people, mm-hmm. uh, the opportunity to create phenomenal relationships with many of our team members, mm-hmm. uh, and to create uh, great relationships with, with our thousands of customers that wow. we now serve all over sure. the world. And um, y- you know, to be able to have a, an impact yeah. Maybe it's just small, but, but be able to have a positive impact on their lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's pretty special. I hear a lot of gratitude in there. Um, I think it was Steve Jobs who said, uh, you can connect the dots looking back. And I kind of heard you doing some of that just then. You mm-hmm. know, there, there was quite, quite the trail there of things that, that really um, came together for you to be right where you are right now. Getting uh-huh. ready to get married and feeling really grateful. That's right. That's right. Yes. M- m- marrying a wonderful woman. Who uh, I wonder each and every day, what in the world does she see in me? <laughs> hmm. oh, well, congratulations. Thank you. That's amazing. Um, I did want to ask you, as, as we talk to entrepreneurs, one of the things we like to ask, just because we're looking at the big picture here of how people get here and the things they've gone through, was there a childhood challenge? Anything that happened in your childhood that you overcame um, that might have informed the person that you became? 
Yeah, so it was a, I'll call it an experience that I think had a deep impact on my life as an entrepreneur. So um, <clears throat> as a little kid, uh, my father worked for a, a big organization, a big company, and I grew up as a kid. Most of my childhood was in uh, Annapolis, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was my entering my, uh, I guess, ninth year, so my early childhood was in Annapolis. My 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 ninth year uh, on this earth, I uh, my, my father got a job transfer to Orlando, Florida, where mm -hmm. I spent the rest of my childhood growing up. And maybe a year after this company had uprooted our entire family and moved us, uh, there was a corporate restructuring, mm -hmm. and he and a number of the people in the unit of the business he worked in. Uh, were, were reorganizationed and lost their, their jobs. Mm -hmm. And so I remember as a kid, you know, I was 10 years old, maybe I was 11. Mm -hmm. And I remember like having a family meeting in the living room where my mother and father shared with my brother and I that, you know, our dad lost his job and it was going to be okay. And we had savings and like there was nothing to worry about, but things would just be different. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember that experience uh, pretty viscerally. And I remember thinking to myself, like, heavens to goodness, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, if you desire stability or certainty in life, then, then working for yourself is actually a better way to do it, mm -hmm. which is what we talked about earlier, yes. than, than, than working for somebody, especially such a big organization where, you know, one, one, one executive's decision 10 layers up could affect you and your livelihood and your family. Mm -hmm. And so I think that having the opportunity to see my dad start a business from the ground up, mm -hmm. having a front row seat, uh, seeing the trials, the tribulations, the highs and the lows, mm -hmm. boy, how lucky I was. And it certainly made a difference. It's what really moved me down the path of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely a childhood experience that initially seemed like the worst thing that could have happened. And when you look back, you say, you know what? That was the best thing wow. that could have happened. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine how different my life would be today mm -hmm. had that not happened. So whomever that executive was at AIG, you have my greatest gratitude yeah. for laying off my father. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing how it influenced you. I wanted to ask you, because we are the business of innovation here, mm -hmm. how creative you consider yourself to be? Mm -hmm. So um, scale of one to ten. So I, I I would say I'm a pretty creative person. Mm -hmm. um, I am probably m as much or more right brain as I am left brain. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, I'm a marketing person. I'm a sales person. Uh, I like to think. I like to create new products. I like to create new services. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to imagine what's possible. Yeah. The, the vision thing is mm -hmm. one of the favorite parts of my job as a, as a CEO. So probably from a creativity perspective, I, I, I probably skew a bit higher. Now, I will say that uh, I'm really good at scanning the business environment and finding great ideas mm -hmm. and then transplanting them to our companies. Sure. So I don't take credit of being the originator mm -hmm. for many of the great ideas that we've implemented at our company, but I do spend a lot of time scanning and looking and then saying, okay, how can we take what somebody's doing in manufacturing mm -hmm. and apply that to publishing? Or how can we take what somebody's doing in film and TV and apply that to software? That's really a lot of fun. And if you think about, um, the future and you think about like what capabilities and what skills do people need to really prosper in the future. I mean, between robots and artificial intelligence, the rote pieces of most businesses will be automated within the next 10 years, maybe mm -hmm. 20 years, right? And so if you're not a knowledge worker, mm -hmm. if you don't have creativity and the ability to think very innovatively, mm -hmm. then I think you're going to have a hard time finding an opportunity or creating an opportunity for yourself, right? So this importance of innovative thinking and strategic thinking and creative thinking, 
I believe with what technology will do becomes even more important now than at any other time in the history Mm -hmm. of our world. So you started down this path already, but tell me what innovation means to you. Yeah, so I think innovation to me is really um, looking at the marketplace. So whatever kind of business you're in or you want to be in, looking at the marketplace Mm -hmm. and saying, how can we create something? How can we add something? Or how can we do something different that adds more value Mm -hmm. to somebody's life than exists today? Mm -hmm. And look, I mean, it doesn't have to be transformational Mm -hmm. things, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, most innovation is incremental innovation. Yes, it is. And incremental innovation can make a person or a company a fortune, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. So, So... The transformational innovation is much more rare. It's much harder to do. And it's Mm -hmm. also the easiest way to fall flat on your face, Mm -hmm. right? But but whether it's incremental or transformative, you know, to me, innovation is all about how do you add more value as an entrepreneur? how How do you and your company add more value to somebody's life that will exchange their precious mm-hmm. hard-earned dollars for that added value you bring them? Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you how do you do that? How do you do that more and better than what exists in the marketplace today? Right, adding value. So having said that, do you consider yourself to be a disruptor? We have taken a very different approach in the publishing industry. Uh, So the publishing industry for centuries was a business where the only way as an author you made money was selling copies of a book in a bookstore. Mm -hmm. In addition, the model in book publishing was I write a manuscript, I hope and pray that an agent will pick me up. Mm -hmm. That agent spends one to two years to try to shop me to a publisher Mm -hmm. who then gets an advance. They then are in charge of marketing my book, and hopefully I'm the one out of 10 that has some success. Mm -hmm. That strategy is not working, especially today, because of all of the information and content choices people have, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, you can just pull up your smartphone and you can entertain, you can educate, you can inform yourself for the rest of time mm-hmm. without ever leaving this device, mm-hmm. right? You don't need books anymore. Yeah. You've got YouTube, right? So we've got to create a different business model for publishing mm-hmm. that captures this change in consumers' content consumption habits. And so the big thing that we did is we said, really the reason a business person, and remember that's our customer, The reason a business person should have a book is not because they're going to make a lot of money selling books in a bookstore, Mm -hmm. but they should be the author of a book because of the authority, the credibility, and the expertise it brings to them. Mm -hmm. And in today's marketplace, authority, credibility, and expertise creates trust. And the only way you sell something in the marketplace is there is trust between the buyer and the seller. I mean, selling is really simply a transfer of trust. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so do I think we're a disruptor? Um, I mean, look, I, I, I'm not going to call ourselves that. I'll let others call us that if they want. Mm-hmm. Do I think that we have completely flipped the model and done things dramatically different than the traditional publishing industry has always done and the way that they've seen it? Mm-hmm. Yes, I do. Very cool. Um, so, What advice do you have for people who want to become more creative or more innovative or want to add value right where they are? What advice would you have for them? Uh, Work on yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So there are people that are born with creativity, Mm -hmm. right? There's creative people, right? Those are the people that might be artists or musicians or filmmakers. So, So there's naturally creative people. But creativity can also be developed and enhanced, right? Because at the end of the day, Mm -hmm. the output from your mind Mm -hmm. is directly correlated with the input of your mind. Garbage in, garbage out. Yes. You know, goodness in, goodness out, right? And Mm -hmm. so, you know, what are you reading? Uh, How are you educating yourself? Mm -hmm. What content are you consuming that has the ability to then come out as something that's an innovative, an innovative idea, mm-hmm. creativity, yeah. etc. So, if you want to become more innovative and creative, 
can't just like will it to happen. Yeah. But one of the things that you can do, I believe, is you can immerse yourself, you can study, and you can put information in your brain mm-hmm. that ultimately can, can turn into more creative and more innovative output. That's great advice. Um, so what's something that you're curious about now? Well, uh, so I'm very curious about artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about how artificial intelligence will change our publishing business. So right now we have a team of over 100 ghostwriters that we pair with our business authors to help them create a book, Mm -hmm. right? And so this is a very bespoke process. This is something where... I don't know that word, bespoke. uh, Very custom tailored. So a very customized process for each person. So um, we we pair a ghostwriter with a business person. The right person. The right person. So it's all about the match. Okay. And the ghostwriter ideally has experience writing on your topic. So let's just say it's, it's medicine. Okay, if if you're writing a book that's medically related, then we want to have a ghostwriter that has experience writing on medical topics. Mm -hmm. Then there's also this personality fit, right? Just like dating and relationships, the ghostwriter and the author, like there's got to be a, Mm -hmm. there's got to be a good fit. And so it's a very custom process and not every time is it a success. Just like if you think back when you were younger to all of the different first dates you had, Mm -hmm. there were a lot of those first dates that didn't turn into a second date because it just wasn't a match. Sure. That's okay. Well, the same thing's true in our ghostwriting business. Mm -hmm. But boy, imagine with artificial intelligence, if you had a computer Mm -hmm. that you could talk to that could then translate your conversation into a beautifully ghostwritten manuscript. Interesting. Holy smokes. Yeah. I mean, the the implications of that are dramatic. I was having lunch earlier this year with a kind of a business leader in the AI, artificial intelligence realm. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that he believes in the not too distant future, there will have to be a disclaimer on content if it's created by artificial intelligence. And so literally, just like you have disclaimers on food packages that Mm -hmm. say this contains GMOs or this contains Mm -hmm. triglycerides, well, you would have a disclaimer on content that says created by artificial intelligence. That's fascinating. Right? Interesting. Now, I I don't yet know, is it good or is it bad? I don't have Mm -hmm. an opinion. Mm -hmm. I just know that it's something that is going to transform and change the content business in a significant way. That's probably what I'm most curious about right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. So um, what do you hope to accomplish going forward? You're young and you've started this and it's just taken off in an amazing way. Your accomplishments are so many. What do you want to accomplish? Well, I I just want to keep doing what we're doing and Mm -hmm. do it better, right? Um, We've got a five-year strategic plan for our company. We we just finished our last five-year strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, We completed it. Uh, about a year ago, December of 2018. Mm -hmm. So we are uh, 11 months in to our new five-year plan. Mm -hmm. So at least for the next uh, four years and one month, I I know what I've got to do. I know what our company has to do to get to the next level of where we want to be. So that's certainly what I'm focused on. That's what I'm uh, excited about. And certainly that's kind of where all my time and attention will be at least for the next four years and one month. So... Best advice you ever received? Boy, the best advice I ever received. Talk about a whopper of a question. Um, There's a lot of good advice that I have received. Um, You know, I I would say that I I go back to this comment that I said earlier in in the program, and that was, your job is not to grow a company. Your job is to grow people to grow a company. Mm -hmm. And my goal when I started my company in... 2005 was like, I wanted to create a real business. Mm -hmm. You know, I I wasn't trying to be a lifestyle entrepreneur that, you know, Mm -hmm. worked from home and had passive income or could travel when Mm -hmm. I wanted or do whatever I wanted. Like, I I wanted to create a real business with people and Mm -hmm. infrastructure and all that. Why, I don't know, but but that's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And so as we've done that, and as we still think there's a lot more work that we have to do, you know, what I realize is that you know, to, to get to a business that's big enough that needs 200 people or 500 people or 1,000 people or 
more than that. It's much more about growing people than it is about growing the business. And so I really do think that if you are an entrepreneur and you want to scale a business, Mm -hmm. your job is to grow people, not a company, Mm -hmm. is probably the most applicable and beneficial advice, certainly for me, that I ever received. Mm -hmm. How do you want to be remembered? How do I want to be remembered? Heavens to goodness. I mean, these are deep questions, Gail. (laughs) Uh, You know, I have not spent much time thinking about that. Um, what I would say is that I think that when, when a person leaves a company, if the company falls apart when the person leaves, the first reaction would be, oh, my God, that person was such a great leader mm-hmm. that they can't do it without him or her. And certainly that would make him or her feel pretty good about themselves, right? Like, oh, my God, I was so important. I was such a big shot. They needed me so much that when I left, the place fell apart. Um, but I really think that, that, that great leaders and, and true businesses, mm-hmm. you know, when the leader leaves, the business does as well or yeah. better than when they were there. And, and that is really about creating a culture. It's about creating an infrastructure. It's about growing leaders to your point. that can step in mm-hmm. to that role, that, that, that are ready, yes. right? Um, if, if I were to get hit by a bus tomorrow, mm-hmm. if the company tanks, then I haven't done a very good job of truly building a sustainable, mm-hmm. enduring organization, mm-hmm. right? So that to me is, I would say, I don't know that I'm proud of it because until I'm wiped off the map, I guess we don't know how the company does without me. Mm -hmm. But certainly one of the things that I would be most proud of Mm -hmm. is that if if I were to depart for any reason, that the company could continue to prosper and grow long after I'm gone. Wonderful. Um, You are incredibly inspiring. I've really loved your answers and your philosophy. What question should I have asked you that I didn't... Mm, what question should you have asked me? Um, well, uh, you know, I, I think that one thing you could ask me, and I'll answer it for you since <laughs> I brought up, is, uh, and I guess this is appropriate for me as a Clemson grad, but if I look back yeah. on my four years at Clemson, mm-hmm. what did I learn or what did I experience that perhaps had the biggest impact on my success. I love your question. And so there's two things that I Mm -hmm. immediately think of. One is the the major I chose. So I was a marketing major at Clemson. And marketing at the end of the day is about, you know, marketing, promoting, advertising, selling your products, services to the marketplace right? Creating value for people that would give you their money in exchange for the value your Mm -hmm. product or service can give them. And as I said earlier, until you sell something, you don't have a business. And one of the things that I find, and and I see it all the time, is Mm -hmm. that there's these brilliant people. They might be scientists. They might be artists. They might be true creatives, but they don't know how to sell Mm -hmm. and market what they've got. And so either one they never really can make the business go anywhere. Or secondly, they have to find a business partner Mm -hmm. or bring in capital, raise capital to bring in people that can do what that founder can't do. And the founder's already diluted uh, before the business has really even done anything. So for me, choosing the marketing major, Mm -hmm. knowing that I would then start a business what a great setup yes. for for starting your own business because you got to be able to market and you got to be able to sell. Yeah. So that would be the first thing. Uh, the second thing, and they really tie in together, <clears throat> is when I was at Clemson, I was a tour guide. I was part of the Clemson University Guide Association. And so I would give tours to prospective students mm-hmm. uh, from all over the country that were coming in for a visit. Which interestingly, my fiance Aaron and I both were tour guides. She at the College of Charleston, uh-huh. me at Clemson. So that's a, a fun fact. But the um, the experience of taking a group of strangers could be fifty to hundred people, mm-hmm. 
And in two hours, the challenge of bonding with them, building rapport with them, mm -hmm. and giving them enough information to get them excited about wanting to bring their stu their child or the child wanting to come to Clemson. Mm -hmm. Like that's a big task. It's a big sure. undertaking. That's selling. <laughs> that's salesmanship. Mm -hmm. And so before I had even graduated, I don't know how many tours I gave over three years, maybe 50 or 100, but over those three years, I had 50 to 100 live auditions of what it would be like to sell in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was invaluable experience. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, and I imagine, I'll just, uh, one last question, but I imagine as you uh, self-described right brain set in your marketing class, and probably had a really good marketing professor and heard a lot of, you know, kind of the, the thinking and the strategies and how marketing works and the visionary aspect and all of that, the psychology of it. That must have really been uh, kind of an, uh, a wonderful um, uh, space for you to be in, I would think. Yeah, it, it helped a lot, yeah. right? Now, now, I mean, at the end of the day, the real world's the real world. Yeah. No matter how good of a professor you have, no matter how mm -hmm. good a class is, it's still a classroom, mm -hmm. right? But if you can take what you learn in the classroom mm -hmm. to better prepare yourself for the real world, then that's the whole point of education and the pursuit of knowledge. And having the ability to get set up and then at Clemson as a, as a guide to be able to essentially practice it, mm -hmm. that was pretty neat too. How strong is the Clemson brand these days? Uh, even more strong than when I was a student. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? It is, right. Adam, I can't thank you enough. Thank you, Gail. So inspiring. What a great pleasure. Yeah. And go Tigers. And go Tigers.